behalf of the entire team of JD Institute of Fashion Technology, I would like to welcome Ms. Akriti Kumar, who has joined us for giving us an insight about the importance of sustainable practices in zero waste. Ms. Akriti Kumar is an alumna from Parsons School of Design, New York, where she did her undergraduation in product design. She moved back to India after working in Germany after her graduation and started her own sustainable furniture design brand by the name of De Furniture. The main design philosophy at De Furniture is to merge the sculptural integrity of art with the functional values of design into a sustainably manufactured products with the help of using reclaimed and salvaged materials and adopting a zero uh, or minimal waste design philosophy. Ms. Akriti's sustainable work at De, De Furniture has got her numerous awards and recognition, such as the Interior Lifestyle Award for Best Product Designer by Ambiente Frankfurt in 2016, The Perspective Magazine, Hong Kong 40 Under 40 in Product Design in 2017, the Forbes Asia 30 Under 30 list of 2018 to name so with uh, this introduction, I would like to hand over to Ms. Akriti to take the session forward with you all. So a very warm welcome, Ms. Akriti. Thank you so much for having me. And um, let me absolutely begin pleasure. by sharing uh, my screen first. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. All right, okay, great. Um, okay, so thank you so much for having me. And um, it's always a, a really exciting time to um, talk to students, uh, the future designers of our country and see how those of us who've made it just a little bit before them, um, how we can guide them through and um, make them follow or get them thinking about some important aspects uh, of design that are prevalent in today's age. Um, as we're all young designers uh, ready to get out into the world, uh, I thought I would share a little bit about, um, again, focused on the sustainable approach that I took um, in my design practice and how you as well can do the same and uh, try and create a little bit of environmentally conscious thinking and dialogue in the products that you decide to do or create uh, in the foreseeable future. So a little bit, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I don't think I need to go too much into that, but yes, my brand is called De Furniture, which breaks up into different furniture. It's sort of a philosophy that um, I look at every day when I'm creating products. Uh, the whole idea of creating something that's different, that's unique, um, and also something that's functional and practical, which I'll be explaining in the um, slides going forward. So uh, through, this, through this talk, through this lecture, I'm going to go uh, point by point onto certain aspects of my design process that I think are important for making um, the furniture happen and realizing um, you know, the premise behind uh, the brand. So these are all philosophies that I encourage you to also think about in your own practices. Uh, it doesn't have to be about furniture, it could be about any product. Uh, that's the beauty of design. Things are so uh, interchangeable and interactive that you can go from one discipline to the other. Um, but these underlining factors do play in uh, pretty much all aspects of design. So I hope you do take away some uh, things from this talk and uh, implement it into your works going forward. So the first thing I like to talk about is um, this idea of art and design. Uh, there are a few um, sort of debates that uh, one thinks about, one, one listens to in the design world is, uh, you know, what is the difference between art and design? What's the difference between form and functionality? And how do they play in um, 
a product design setting or any sort of actual physical product. So for me, um, the idea of creating something beautiful, uh, of course, went down the art uh, route, something that is, that's aesthetically pleasing, something that is uh, beautiful to look at. And then the design element of my products always look at um, how this can be used. Is it actually a product? So uh, marrying the two uh, imp the, the important elements from each category and blending it into a product is what I like to um, sort of focus on with every piece that I do make. So if you look at this from afar, uh, it's actually a very interesting um, sort of a web of wood, but uh, zooming out is actually a fragment of a bed. So uh, looking at different sides of the same coin uh, is something that I like to challenge myself for each product that I do create. Moving on to um, form and function, like I just mentioned, um, again, it's a very important aspect to not only have something look beautiful, but it should also behave in a practical, functional, user-friendly method. So the, um, for me, I like, uh, sometimes I like taking form in a bit of a crazy direction. Uh, for example, this chair in front of you is the, one of my examples of wooden upholstery. So this is a technique that I have been working on for a few years now. And I um, wanted to create, uh, you know, we have this notion of wood being something that's very um, rigid and solid and, 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 you know, hard and uncomfortable, so to speak. And I wanted to take that notion and sort of turn it, turn it on its head and create a, a product where you actually look at a material that you, you feel you known for so long to work in a certain way and behave in a certain way, but actually changing that norm and making it um, behave in a totally different way. So uh, again, going back to the the name wooden upholstery, I wanted to create something that's flexible and malleable, but made out of wood. And um, of course, I do. You may see this uh, in more of my examples going forward, but I do like to um, sort of make people feel a little uncomfortable when they look at something. Um, until they interact with it. So when you look at this piece, it's got a lot of uh, sharp angles and you know geometric sharp shapes. And that uh, gives the user a little bit of an apprehension because they're like, this can't possibly be comfortable. But when one actually sits down on it and you see that the weight that you apply on it makes the pieces move according to your, um, your posture and your, your seat, that actually makes a very, um, it changes the perception of the customer, of the client, uh, of the person sitting and using it, the user. So uh, that's something that I like to play around with a lot. And I will explain with examples going forward how I've used um, this technique of wooden upholstery to uh, sort of change the norms of how we look at uh, materials. Uh, so yeah, going forward, uh, this is sort of the premise of the furniture, um, looking at a sustainably produced product, using reclaimed materials, salvage, leftover scrap wood to create something new, uh, was, was actually started off when I moved back to India and uh, I was looking for materials at the time. And I came across this um, vast uh, array of materials that were actually being used once and then just getting discarded. So uh, there was uh, an opportunity there to actually take this so-called scrap material and turn it into something new. Of course, back then, uh, you know, I had learned this uh, idea of sustainability and sustainable practices uh, back in college at Parsons. Um, may not have thought about it before that uh, because I guess the exposure wasn't really there in India. And uh, actually understanding that as designers, it's really important for us to create something because it is going out into the world. We need to be conscious of what we're creating and how we're creating it. So initially when I started looking at these reclaimed woods and materials, I was quite interested in using them to create something new, but I did it for myself. It was something that I felt like I owed to myself as a designer to be able to create. And I also wanted um, to do something 
right. I wanted to put less impact on the environment. And it was sort of something that I kept to myself. Uh, as the furniture started growing and people started, uh, of course, when you look at the products firsthand, it's difficult for you to gauge whether they are made from reclaimed materials. But um, it's a dialogue that sort of started very organically when people would ask me about the products. And the more and more I spoke about it and spoke a little bit about the sustainable side of sourcing the material, the more people got excited about um, about this um, this dialogue of of looking at you know what sort of materials uh, we use. For me, it was more as a designer, but I was I was really excited and glad to see that even the consumer was conscious about what sort of purchases they make and what impact the products that they buy have on the environment. So. As that sort of shift happened, um, of course, we would talk about a lot, a lot about sustainability in the US and other places in the West. But um, moving back to India, I wasn't sure whether people were ready to hear that. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, that shift did definitely start happening. So my focus on sustainability and, and talking about it and making people aware of it uh, became more important as the years of the furniture went on. So looking at, so I do tend to, for example, um, use uh, sort of reclaimed wood, the pine that you see in this chaise uh, in the image with the triangles of the wooden upholstery is made out of um, shipping container pine wood where automotive parts are placed uh, within it in these big crates and they come, they get shipped to India and then the crates and the plywood boxes are all dismantled. And then they basically just sell them as scrap or firewood or other things. So um, using that material um, was a really interesting uh, idea of converting something that's had its life, it's been used for its purpose, and then um, I'm able to extract components out of it and turn it into um, a new product. Of course, that being said, um, using wood that's already been used once, there are limitations and restrictions as to how you can use it because they will probably be cut to a certain length. They will have some marks in it, some holes in it from its past life. So one has to work around those limitations, but it's still an exciting challenge to see how you can create something out of, which is essentially, which is just scrap and make it into something beautiful and new. And for me, that's like one of the, the highlights when I create something. Again, uh, going back to the sustainable angle and approach of uh, the furniture, there's certain things which may not seem like they're very um, important at the time, but uh, is this idea of the finishes and the coat that we put on top mm -hmm. of uh, any product, be it furniture, be it anything. Uh, the furniture industry is very uh, polyester, PU, high gloss, plastic uh, dominated when it comes to finishes and polishes. So that tends to be um, not only harmful for the person who's applying it because of its toxic nature when you're spraying these uh, finishes on top of a uh, final product, but also if you look at a product in a, in a cradle to cradle sort of system that if you build something, and you want to see what happens at the end of its life when it's destroyed, so to speak, or what is what goes out into the atmosphere at that point or into the environment at that point. So if you were to say, let's for sake of argument, um, talk about um, a PU high gloss table that has to maybe be incinerated and burnt to ash to reach its final you know, resting place. Uh, what sort of chemicals and things will get emitted out of that at that stage? Uh, which they get applied on in the beginning of their life. So once something is applied on, it's also as damaging to take that off. So I, um, from the beginning, when I was starting out, uh, I did experiment with uh, PU because that was the, the norm. Like if you, any carpenter or anybody who came to you that said, this is the way it's supposed to be finished. But um, Initially, I, I wanted to do more research and kind of understand that, okay, if I am taking this direction of being sustainable, then I think what I put on top of my final product will have a lot to say with, along with, you know, the material that I use and how I produce it. So um, I started using oils and waxes that were more of a, 
a more sustainable sort of less toxic way of uh, finishing a product because if you look at wood for example it's already a very solid rigid hard uh, resilient material and there is actually no need to put something so heavy duty on it to to increase its longevity so um i decided to do away with pus and go straight into oils and and non toxic waxes and it was actually during a uh, lockdown last year that uh, i spent a considerable amount of time in the mountains and that's where i started researching a little bit more because I, as up till this point i was just buying store bought uh, oils and waxes that i felt were followed the same sustainable approach as mine but since i did have time to research more on it uh, i did find out a lot about beeswax and other kinds of oils that one could use and blend together to make um make a really strong water resistant mold resistant um finish on wood so as of last year i've been creating my own finishes my own oils oil and wax blends which are made from um i got the beeswax from a beekeeper that was living in the village that i was living in and uh the uh, cold pressed uh, oil of seeds that had been uh pressed and taken out from around the himalayas so uh looking at local materials looking at because we were kind of locked down it was difficult to get stuff from outside uh i had to sort of think about how i can use this direction and look at an even more sustainable approach to um finishing so the the coat that i put on my products now is um completely um uh, sustainable totally non toxic so much so you can use it as lip balm as well if you like so i have uh, been quite excited about that development and i do share it with others as well when they uh, talk about sustainable um finishes so if one were to take um you know start like baby steps into a sustainable approach you know you maybe sourcing reclaimed materials might be a little overwhelming but why not think about the final coat or something that you put on it could be just as important and yet easier to achieve uh something to think about for you guys uh yeah so of course um you know india is the land of craft and craftsmen and we've been following uh this whole uh you know uh, parents teach the craft to their kids and they teach them to their kids and it's this ongoing um sort of lineage of skilled workers across the board and i when i moved back of course while i was in the us uh there was a very uh, automated a uh, way of doing things there were machines everything was uh, computer generated 3d printers all of that i mean that was coming up but now it's way more uh, prevalent and and run of uh, you know just the way that things are these days uh, back then of course we did have a little bit of manual hand work that went into creating a product but um, when i moved back to india there was a huge shift between how things were done in the west as opposed to here and in a way i kind of uh, enjoyed that experience of uh, having to unlearn a few things that i learned in the west because i had to adapt with how things are made here and of course um, we are very uh, hand craft centric as a as a society as a country and i didn't want to lose that aspect when i was creating my own products of course i can i can uh, be able to make whatever i make now in a very automated sort of fashion but i'm not a brand that uh, does mass market in the you know hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands uh, i like to again go back to the idea of i'm creating something that's sculptural with a function so having thousands of these pieces out there is going to defeat that purpose of something being sculptural and also um i think the beauty of the handcrafted ness of a product shows a little bit about its journey and again when i uh, commented on uh, the past life of the product so if i go back to the previous slide uh, if you look uh, closely you see little black dots in various parts of this chair and they are actually from uh, nail marks and uh, iron bits and bolts that were uh, embedded into these uh, shipping containers or uh, boxes 
to assemble them and then once they were used they were kind of pulled out but these uh this discoloration and uh, the holes and everything was was still very much part of the product instead of hiding them away or like polishing them over to to camouflage the imperfection i wanted to enhance it so that you actually get an idea of where this piece is coming from and where it's um where it's been and what it's become now which is similar to this idea of creating something by hand it's got its own beauty in its imperfection which i really like and would like to uh, continue working on that element as well as you know as as craftsmen as the skilled workers it's up to us as designers to you know of course they know a specific way of doing something which is which is incredible for me and my team we're always working hand in hand on the shop floor figuring stuff out materials are you know one can't work in a vacuum you have to sort of work with the actual material see its properties understand how it works and there could be a lot of things that you may not have accounted for uh, had you done this uh, like on a cad drawing and when you're actually working on the material in reality and even things like dew point and humidity can make a huge effect on uh, the wood or other materials as well uh, and that's something that you need to figure out when you're actually physically working with the product so for that um, situation i really like working in this very uh, tangible sort of experience uh, from the beginning i didn't like a lot of people when starting out tend to outsource their products make a design and then get it made outside but for me it was since we were creating and building sculptural pieces from scratch uh, we were not going by the traditional modes of woodworking by the the typical ways of joining and and doing woodworking so we had to actually create and build and make our own um like frames or um even like bits of machine like drill bits and things like that we had to build ourselves which was incredible because working with these skilled workers um i came from a very automated way of creating something and they came from a very analog sort of tactile way of creating so that uh, blend was really incredible for looking at how things can be created in a different way so for that um i'm glad to be in india because it's it's such a um, we get to experiment a lot more with um actually looking at materials and working with materials uh, and the best way to do that is actually touching and feeling the work um as opposed to just creating models and um sketches which of course is the initial part of things but uh, of of the ideation phase but for me um giving you an insight into my design process uh i like to if some some things don't work out the way that you would think you'll get more clarity when you're actually physically creating the product and there will be ups and downs and some prototypes will fail but uh, you'll get a better understanding and knowledge of the material that you work with so um again going back to creating something sculptural creating something one of a kind uh what i like to do is uh this is i'll give you a little back story on this particular product it's uh, one of the first pieces that i ever made and uh, i just returned back from the us and uh, from germany and i we were getting some renovations done in our house and there were some carpenters working on some woodwork uh, once the work finished i asked my parents i said you know i i, I have some ideas in mind and i want to kind of create something so uh, you know i'd like to take the carpenters and work on something for a bit so we so i have spent a considerable time in the mountains uh, throughout my childhood and i wanted to create something inspired by the topography and the undulations of um the earth surface in the mountains like they they have the step farms and the terrace gardens uh it's all to make uh, you know the land more efficient to cultivate on but there's a beauty in those steps as well when you see them from afar in in um a sort of zoomed out um expanse so my idea was to so uh, of course i i got my little cardboard sheets and i said okay let me try and figure out how i'm going to make this and uh i was interested in this whole idea of layering material one on top of the other so i started with my cardboard and started cutting pieces together and then stacking them together 
And I showed it to the carpenter and I said, you know, this is what I want to make. And I really like this really, you know, the, the edge of the plywood is really beautiful and I want to show that off. So he says, okay, um, you know, why not? Why don't we just make a box of it and then we'll just carve out whatever you need to carve out and you'll be able to make a piece. So just thinking about what he said and where my direction was, uh, I, I felt like, okay, if I'm going to be using layers, uh, then why not build it up from the ground up and whatever piece that I extract from the larger component that you can see on top, uh, I'll use it for my other balancing component at the bottom. And that got me thinking about looking at, okay, if I um, allocate a certain amount of material for a specific project, it would be ideal to use every bit of it without any waste. Yeah. So that's when this whole idea of zero waste kind of came into um, my thinking and how, okay, of course I'm using um, the plywood from the shipping container boxes, but how do I get um, at the production phase? How do I get this to have no waste? So building this up. So the smaller piece actually comes out of the larger piece. So in this particular um, setting, it is a zero waste product. But um, in an ideal world, it is difficult to create absolutely zero waste. And that's what um, got me thinking that, okay, I, I am uh, looking at uh, sourcing reclaimed materials. I'm looking at non-toxic finishes. And then I'm looking at um, zero waste uh, or minimal waste design. So what is the next step for this? So, um, yeah, one, uh, yeah, I think this slide should have probably made it lower, but I'll just talk about it really quickly and then I'll come back to the point. So again, um, talking about uh, being inspired by nature, there's something really beautiful about, um, like I said, the topography of the nature, um, just natural elements and phenomenon in nature that can be really inspiring for creating products. And that's always been my go-to when I've created something. Uh, so, for example, um, water droplets, and this is a, a, a detailed shot of a console, a teak console that I created, um, which follows this whole idea of the ripples in, um, in water and, and the fluidity of that motion. Um, another way of looking at nature is actually looking at the material uh, how it is uh, in its natural state. So as we all know, when a tree grows, uh, new rings form around the trunk and uh, depict how old it is and year by year, it keeps getting thicker and thicker. So instead of uh, polishing that off and making it something where you can't actually see the material or painting over it, uh, I find it um, for me, for my, my designs, I like to show off that texture and that those rings and the, the grain of the wood because that's the most beautiful, most natural part of, um, of the wood piece. And why hide that um, even by, you know, polyester finishes or even by paint, like there's no point. It, it has so much beauty and so much to say. Again, each product is something that I believe, um, you know, we do live in a very throwaway culture where we, we create, we, we use something once and we get rid of it. Um, I do see that that shift is now um, going towards the more sustainable, even in our day-to-day -day practices and purchases. But um, this whole idea of like looking at the material, um, making sure it's sturdy and resilient enough to last a long time, maybe even like an heirloom, something you can pass from one person to another, rather than just being um, something that uh, you use once, you pick up from Ikea and then you know you shift to another place and it just breaks down in the middle and you don't really know uh, what to do with it. And it's like, a, in a way, maybe just a one-time use product. So uh, I think even for furniture, it's important to look at the longevity of these pieces that they're not going anywhere anytime soon. They probably outlive, uh, you know, one uh, one lifetime as well, if not more. And uh, sort of that idea of the closeness of nature and figuring out um, how we can make these products um, reflect nature within our spaces as well. Uh, that's something that I find important when designing my pieces. Uh, so yeah, so now coming back uh, to our previous uh, conversation is again, you know, zero waste is an 
ideal situation. Uh, one, it would be amazing to not create any waste and uh, whatever you sought out to create, you did within the material that you had reserved for that particular product. But we all know that that doesn't happen. So um, designing with waste is something that I uh, started looking at. So looking at past projects, uh, especially when there's something that you, you're making for somebody, if you're designing um, part of a collection, it's a different thing you can still put in more focus as to how the piece is produced and how um, less waste gets extracted out of it. But when you're working as for, uh, as per a client's specifications, space and all of that, those things tend to take a little bit of a backseat. So one does get left with um, some waste uh, from past projects. So that's when um, I decided to look at that and see how one can utilize those small fragments of wood that one would test uh, essentially consider useless or have to be discarded because they're so small and insignificant. But um, this got me thinking about how I can use just the discard and create new pieces out of it. So this particular example is another um, approach of uh, the wooden upholstery. In the previous one, uh, the pieces were sort of compressed onto a material that when you sat on it, they would move uh, uh, according to your weight, uh, sort of as a skin that was flexible, almost like a fabric. But in this particular chair, the dot chair, uh, each uh, dowel that's been extracted out from leftover um, past project uh, teak pieces uh, goes down uh, with the amount of pressure that you apply on it. So when one actually sits on a chair like this, um, the parts that get more pressure tend to sink further down and those that get less pressure tend to uh, curve around. So you actually get a really nice hug and a really nice uh, cushioning when you're sitting on something like this. Again, when you're looking at images, it's difficult to understand that until you actually feel and uh, use the product. So yeah, uh, talking about waste and uh, talking about these leftover fragments and small pieces, uh, I came up with this idea called Tessellate, which was a collection um, where I would just look at what was left over and lying around in, uh, in my workshop and use that exclusively to create new things. And uh, Tessellate, uh, if I'm sure most of you young designers already know, um, is a way of creating patterns using the same geometric shape. So if you take a triangle and you repeat it around, you can get a more complex pattern using just that one shape. So I tried uh, experimenting with a lot of different shapes. And uh, this is a little insight into how um, I would extract the pieces. Of course, it's, it's extremely labor intensive work, but the kind of details and the kind of textures that you get uh, at the end of the day are well worth um, that effort. So again, you can see different colors, uh, different species of wood, different uh, species of ply, and they've all been put together um, in these interesting hexagonal rhombus, um, trapezoid sort of shapes. And just replicating them over and over creates more patterns and more fluidity. And again, um, why hide the beauty of the patterns in the wood when you can actually um, show them off this way? So here is another example. I'll walk you through a few examples of, uh, of the Tessellate collection. Uh, again, this is from the image that I showed in the previous one. This is the finished product. So the sides of this chair are um, made in solid wood, uh, again, fragmented uh, solid pieces, whereas the middle uh, bit is in this wooden upholstery skin. Uh, another example of how the, these uh, trapezoid sort of shapes um, merge into one another when sort of they create really interesting patterns. Sometimes you might see like star shapes, sometimes you'll see hexagonal shapes. Um, and the beauty of using different grains to connect different um, pieces together also looks really interesting. So from chairs to even tables uh, have been created using exclusively the scrap that had been generated from, from previous projects. And um, the image on the left is um, sort of the first product that uh, I worked on in the wooden upholstery series. Uh, trying to understand how I can create this flexible wooden skin 
And uh, the other image of the sofa, the single seat of sofa is um, sort of where I'm at right now, still um, always iterating more and more because the material is uh, quite interesting. And when you throw in different grains into it, you can actually play around with how it will look. Uh, so this is uh, entirely flexible from every angle. Of course, you sit on the seat part of it, but um, it gives, uh, and again, uh, I like to make people a little afraid of uh, sitting on these sort of things because I do tend to pick really um, exaggerated shapes and pointy shapes. So, but once someone does sit on it to see that look on their face when they realize that it's actually something that's very flexible and comfortable, um, that's like the best feeling for me. Again, another example of um, a table, a coffee table. So this is done in two parts. Uh, so you can actually move it around and fit it into slot uh, one piece into the other at different uh, elements to create a, sort of a, a, a larger piece, or you could split it up into two and have two smaller pieces together, uh, sort of playing off of this idea of tessellation, but at a very small level as well as at a larger level. So I uh, have worked on similar designs where there have been more components, three or even one larger one, and uh, it comes out really beautifully. And to see that this would all just be like discarded as, um, you know, unusable and actually being able to create something really beautiful out of it. Um, I think that's one of the, the most exciting parts of a designer to be able to utilize all the material and uh, create something new. So again, uh, going back to one of um, the initial uh, designs of the chaise that has been done in different iterations now, but uh, this was made out of a teak uh, that was from an old flooring from an old house and the triangles were cut out from that flooring and the um, structure was made out of teak and uh, pine plywood. So that um, was again, uh, one of the initial experiments that I wanted to share with you. Now, uh, going into um, going into the whole uh, idea of looking at your um, scrap and your waste and how you can make that into something that's um, beautiful instead of just discarding it. Uh, this little segue of lighting also did come about. Uh, initially, I would make mostly large scale furniture pieces, but um, before tessellation came about, uh, I decided to use my um, smaller leftover past project scraps uh, for lighting as well. So here are a few examples uh, of lighting. And um, I have used um, some layering techniques of plywood, layer them together because they were all different pieces and then carved them out to reveal different uh, colors, different grains. Uh, and this is also part of an uh, initial ideation when I was starting out at the furniture. Um, if you look at this, uh, and then of course, even to try and understand how one can create um, zero waste in some sort of sense. Uh, if you look at the, the candle, the, the images in the middle, which are the candlestick, uh, and then on the left side, you have the bubbles. They're actually, if you flip the bubbles around, they fit perfectly into the candlestick um, profile. So they've actually been cut out from the same piece. So it's just uh, about how one can look at actually uh, utilizing a material in a more efficient way, rather than, you know, if I were to cut out these bubbles uh, from different pieces of ply and then cut out the candlestick from another one, then there would be a lot of wastage. So it's really important to actually plan out how you use the material because that makes a huge difference. Of course, with the tessellation um, series, it's a little difficult to do that because um, it's, it's difficult and easy in a way because you have these small pieces and either you, you cut out even smaller uh, components from those pieces to create something complex or uh, you have to work that this is a whole process, a tedious process of cutting and making everything the same um, is also tricky. So I'm, I'm not saying it's an easy approach to take, but again, you know, I feel like as a designer, it is, um, I have decided to choose this path of being sustainable. So whatever I can do in my power to do that, um, that's usually what I like to go for. Uh, okay, so lastly, I would like to 
talk a little bit about, um, so far we've spoken about my journey as a furniture designer and uh, looking at individual products. So this is a, a project uh, called Tranquil that I started, it's, it's been long overdue also, and uh, I did start it quite a few years ago. Um, but uh, like I said, I've spent a lot of time in the mountains and I have um, my aesthetic, uh, the closeness to nature, the, the actual um, using wood and the warmth and the natural green and all of that uh, is something that maybe subconsciously did come from my time in the mountains. And that's why this whole like cabin sort of uh, wooden feel of a space is something that's really close to me. And I knew that, okay, uh, I, I do enjoy furniture thoroughly and uh, creating new products, but uh, my ideal setting uh, for using that kind of furniture would be in the hills. So I knew that at some point I would like to create uh, entire homes uh, for customers, for clients who are looking for second or third homes uh, in the mountains and who like nature and like the Himalayas to actually spend time over there with using uh, design and materials in an efficient way. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people do uh, tend to, you know, builders and architects do tend to come up from the plains uh, and try and mimic houses that work well in the, in the plains with houses in the mountains. And that tends to not go very well because the, the climate is different, the terrain is different. Um, it gets very cold, there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of snow. Uh, so one has to work uh, in a very different mindset compared to um, how one works uh, in the plains uh, because of the temperature and everything. So you have to look at, think of insulation, you have to think of uh, the warm materials, you have to sort of understand how you can make this space cozy because primarily around the year it is cold. And um, it was actually exactly a year ago today on the 20th of March 2020 that I went up to the Himalayas and the nationwide lockdown happened on the 23rd. And I stayed there till December without coming back to Delhi. So there's a lot of things that uh, I realized while I was there actually in the space, of course I would travel very often up to the mountains, but um, this particular sample house that I'm showing you images of uh, was made about three years ago. So it is something that's been in the pipeline for a while, but it was only during this uh, lockdown time that I, uh, felt that, okay, this is what I need to focus on. I have spent a lot of time working on furniture and on lighting and on other things, but this is something that is uh, true to my heart and it's a project that I've wanted to initiate for quite some time now, but haven't got the chance or the time to do so. So um, I'm glad that we had this little bit of a reset uh, with 2020 and uh, I was able to kick kickstart my uh, project. Uh, so that's sort of the next step of what I'm what I'm doing now. And uh, I just wanted to say that another um, approach, since this is a zero design, zero waste design um, lecture, uh, the, it is even if you create a zero waste product, uh, there still will be sawdust from the sanding, there still will be sawdust from the cutting uh, that gets left over and that tends to pile up. So Another thing that I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I had the time to focus on this past year was uh, looking at even the most minute uh, leftover material and see how I can utilize that. So like I mentioned, it's very cold in the mountains. Uh, I, my place is in a small village uh, in Uttarakhand and uh, people tend to, the villagers around tend to cut trees and um, branches for their winter time to, for their food and everything, because it is very remote and very out of the way. And that's their only source of warmth and heat and able to cook food. So um, I utilized um, my sawdust that I had collected with the products and things that I had made over, um, over the past few years and um, started experimenting with uh, fire starters, which are basically bricks uh, with which I compressed uh, sawdust with um, turpentine oil, uh, crude turpentine oil, which is basically the sap that comes out of the pine trees. And uh, in the hills, there are many pine trees all over. So everything was sort of locally sourced. And we uh, created, um, I got the village uh, people to help me to make these compact bricks 
of uh, um, like fire starters for them to use. Um, I'm still experimenting with it, but it's going pretty well. And uh, eventually when I do have enough sawdust and enough fire starters, we would be distributing them around the villages. And um, rather than them cutting down forests, which is something that they have to do, it's not um, that there isn't much of a choice, but if one can use your leftover and use it and create something new that can benefit others, then um, maybe that's another way of looking at a more sustainable approach. So um, that's uh, where I'm at right now. Uh, I've been uh, going to be starting um, construction on these houses, of course, using local wood, uh, local um, masons and artisans, people who are in and around the village. Uh, even my carpenters at the time during lockdown, I um, had them, they, they had moved back in the migrant shift of, uh, from, from the south and they moved back to their, the same village that I was, uh, we were all locked down in and uh, there was no work, there was nothing to do and I just asked around because even my, uh, initially my manufacturing used to be in Delhi but uh, all of my carpenters and my team sort of vanished uh, just before COVID because there was that fear, there was that anxiety of um, you know, being stuck in one place. So they all decided to go back. And it was at that point that when we were in the mountains and uh, I did ask around, I said, you know, is there any carpenter who's here? And luckily they turned out to be some guys uh, who had moved back and they were also looking for work. And of course, when I showed them the sample house and everything, and I wanted to start working because uh, I knew that, you know, this is not something that's going to finish off in the next few weeks or months, um, you know, we're probably in here for the long haul. So they were very apprehensive about um, maybe they felt overwhelmed by the design content and they hadn't really been exposed to that sort of thing. But uh, they said, you know, we, we only do like door frames and windows and uh, this sort of work is beyond our caliber. So I said, okay, fine, you know, I need, um, I'd been working on my factory in the hills and I needed work uh, to continue with some windows and things uh, for that space. So I started them off with that. And then, um, you know, people always ask me, they're like, you know, you do very complex uh, designs, but how do your people, how do your workers, how do your skilled carpenters, how do they deal with it? So the idea is basically not to overwhelm them with the final product or a final rendering. Uh, you keep that in your head because if you show them something, uh, they will not know how to go about it. So I break it down into bite-sized chunks for them to sort of understand um, and then build from the ground up in a very systematic order. So when they started off, they were just doing window frames, but by the end of it, um, we made very complex wooden upholstery um, area, like uh, products for like uh, a new cabin that I'm working on right now. So, and, and just seeing that look on their faces when they realized what they had created and what they had achieved uh, felt really good. So, you know, as designers, we will be outsourcing a lot of things. We do get a lot of things made. So the idea isn't to like overwhelm someone with your product. It's about trying to break it down into small enough pieces that they can understand and then uh, building it up uh, from, from, from scratch to a final tangible product. So that's where um, I'm at right now. I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and there are a few food for thought things that you can take away from this. Of course, um, I wouldn't say, you know, you have to do all of these things, but even if you put one or two in motion in your practices, in your designs, in your products, be it during school or even afterwards when you get out into the world, uh, if you're working for somebody else, if you're working for yourself, um, there are a lot of things that one can incorporate that can make a difference. It may not seem so, but it's very possible. Uh, so thank you for listening to me and I hope you enjoyed. I think you're still on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Akriti, for this valuable insight into zero waste design. I mean, your design philosophy is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, I would say like uh, it leads to uh, metamorphosis of the waste and uh, regenerate uh, something outstanding, aesthetic and beautiful and functional. 
So I'm sure, you know, the students here will be definitely inspired to be in your footsteps and definitely they will make a change like you. So it's, it's only with that exposure that um, they will get that chance. For me, I learned uh, sustainability and the importance of it in college. So I hope that they take away something from, you know, we are the future, they are the future. Rather. So it's all up to them uh, how they treat the world. Absolutely. So, uh, I, so I would request everyone, you know, like uh, if you want to ask Ms. Sakriti, please write down in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any questions? I can probably stop the share now. Hi, Rohan. Please go ahead, Rohan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. <laughs> um, well, uh, tips on getting more creative. Uh, I think, you know, we, we're all always glued onto our computers and we're always working on stuff, typing away. But I think the whole idea of actually picking up like a paper and a pencil and, and you know, just working through things. For me, like my paper and pencil is more... Um, actually working with materials. Like I said, with my first uh, product, I took like cardboard sheets and I tried to put them together and see how they would work or really thin pieces of wood and mimic what the final product would be. So um, with, with 3D products, uh, I think it's nicer to be able to uh, actually build something rather than have something in a very two dimensional format. Even if it's uh, computer generated, maybe I'm like, from a different generation, but I still like to be more tangible with my hands rather than create on the computer. Uh, just because, uh, and then of course, working with actual materials that will really uh, add to that. You know, you don't know when you get that sudden spark where you're like, oh, this could be used really well in this direction, or why don't I try in the other way? So um, actually working with the material that you want to work with. And that makes a huge difference and then you know doodle and, and work and write and uh, actually use your hands I think that'll maybe there's some connect with uh, hand movement and the brain and and it uh, you know stimulating you to be more creative I I don't have any science to back that up but I do think that when you're actually making with ha with your hand it makes a big difference so you have to be experimental in your design yes. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. In all sort of medium, all materials. Like with um, when I was at Parsons, we had um, some projects. Uh, like for example, our first project uh, in furniture design was to build a chair, and we had to use bendable plywood for it. But in the beginning, before we actually made the chair, we uh, had to make a cardboard model, life size model of the chair, and actually sit on it, and it had to take our weight. So just looking at how one works with very, I mean, you don't even have to look at material that's very difficult to find. Just stuff that's lying around uh, can make a huge difference. Like uh, we initially in product design, they made us make a shoe that had to be about three inches tall, uh, like a platform shoe made out of just like normal printer paper and uh, without any gluing or any other sort of mechanism. So, and we had to stand on it and uh, it had to support our body weight. So it's just looking at, taking those few elements and looking at different ways to challenge yourself using very like, you know, everyday sort of materials. I did um, take a, a lecture, um, a co-taught a class in the US with one of my professors from Parsons uh, just like about six months ago. And uh, because everyone was in lockdown, uh, the classes had to be via Zoom. 
and uh, they the, the students had to literally find material that was just lying around for the project or they could get access to easily because they had to work within they couldn't go to the workshops and you know build things and have access to all sorts of machines and things so it was quite amazing to see the sort of work that they came up with even though they didn't have that um, sort of exposure and access to um, all sorts of um, like fancy materials, so to speak. So that was a that was really great. So look within, see what you have lying around, and it'll get your juices flowing. <laughs> so one has to challenge the norms and go yes, the norms. Yes. Exactly, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, so uh, there's one more question here, and uh, he's asking how many, how much time uh, does it take to learn? Um, <laughs> so. I did learn, so the, the, the good thing about um, the US uh, education of uh, learning is of teaching rather, is that they um, give you a very systematic sort of foundation and then other things on top of that, that give you the ability to create stuff on your own. So whatever materials you require, whatever softwares you need, whatever techniques you need to know, that's all taught at a very fundamental level. And then finally, by the end of it, before you graduate, um, you're given uh, the time to do a thesis project where everything you've learned, uh, you channel into this very self-driven project. And actually my whole idea of wooden upholstery is a spin-off of my thesis project where I created um, flexible apparel made out of wood. So uh, instead of apparel and actual um, like fashion, it became uh, furniture for me going forward. So that way it was quite interesting to, um, to work on. So I think it's about learning all that you can um, inside the classroom and outside. Teaching yourself also, I think is really important for, um, for designers. And then, um, you know, seeing how that sort of translates into products. And that's something that uh, so it will take, you're never done learning. You're always learning new things. Uh, so don't, don't ever think that just because you'll be done with your, your program means you don't need to learn anymore. It's always a constant update learning. And design is, after all, always a work in progress. There's always room for improvement. There's always room for learning and getting inspired and spinning off into other iterations of the same. So uh, don't ever close that door. Just keep keep going, keep keep iterating. So... Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, all right. So, uh, before we wind up the session, Ms. Akriti, uh, I would request that uh, we take a group photograph with all the students. Okay. So, I would request everyone to put on their videos. Quickly have a photograph with uh, Ms. Akriti. All right. So on the count of three, we are all set to go for the photograph. Okay. So one, two, and three. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure. All the best. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.